Thanks very much, David, and welcome everyone uh, to this edition of the Entrepreneurship Hour. It's my privilege to introduce Fred Gibbons. Fred received both a bachelor's and master's degree here in engineering quite a few years ago, back in 1972. After that, he attended Harvard Business School. After graduating from Harvard, Fred became a product and marketing manager for Hewlett Packard. After that, he founded Software Publishing Corporation in 1981, together with two of his former colleagues from Hewlett Packard. Software Publishing Corporation's first major products were for Steve Jobs, Apple II computer, and shortly thereafter for IBM, and also for Bill Gates' brand new Microsoft Corporation. After this company, SPS, was acquired, Fred founded Venture Concept, a venture firm which was committed to investing in startups, and that was still a somewhat newer thing back then. In nearly 15 years, or four to nearly 15 years, Fred has served as a consulting professor and lecturer in the electrical engineering department at Stanford, concentrating at the graduate level. And it's great to see that Fred doesn't spend all his time working. He's a pilot, and he's also a self-trained artist. He does oil paintings. I think that's fantastic because most engineers are musicians or artists also. <laughs> Uh, Fred is personally connected to a number of well-known and highly regarded entrepreneurs, and he remains very active in the Bay Area startup scene. I dare say that if you're in the Bay Area and you're thinking about starting Google, the first person you talk to is Fred Gibbons. Fred, thanks. 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 You know, I always find it so challenging when I'm introduced, you know, kind of, Engineers are kind of modest people, you know? <laughs> and I listen to that story and I, I'm reminding myself, we're in Angel Hall, right? And I think about the first time I sat in here for some physics exam or some physics course. And if you'd ever told me that someday I would be back here in Angel Hall talking to you all, you could have knocked me over with a stick. I mean, it's, it's, quite, it's quite remarkable. And I think of the Larry Page was one of my students or the Jerry Yang was one of my students or Sabera Bakhtia who did Hotmail. You know, you never know. You really don't. Larry Page didn't impress me. Nice guy, <laughs> founder of Google. Um, but uh, you know, so I, it's just, it's, it's quite credible that one of you will take my place here and we just don't know when. It's an amazing journey and it happens. It happens for a lot of good reasons, not the least of which being the perspective we get here at the university, the values we've learned, and our desire, our hunger, our ambition to do great things, to change the world. So that's, the, that's kind of the melting pot of where the next Larry Page or Bill Gates or Steve Jobs will come from. And just to build a touch on that theme, I knew Steve Jobs for many, many years since he was 19 years old, and it was always about doing something great. It was never about the money. And for me, it's always been the case that it's never about the money. I'm a little discouraged by what's happening in Silicon Valley these days. It seems like it is about the money. And it's funny, when I come on campus here, I really come back to my roots, the roots being what you're trying to accomplish, what you're trying to build, what you're trying to work on. I feel much more comfortable in this group than I do today in presenting in Silicon Valley. It's just changed in a way that I'm, I'm less comfortable with. And I stress again that it's just the excitement of working with great people, solving a great problem. There's nothing better than that. Forget the money. You couldn't replace it with anything by hanging out with smart people. And, and changing the world. So with that as a background, I'm always asked, how do you see new markets? How do you, how do, how do you build new companies? And there's a famous um, design school professor at Stanford called David Kelly. He teaches a thing called design thinking. And some of the same principles apply when I think about how you identify new markets. The first principle is observe. What do you observe? What do you see? There's a whole second question, which is, well, yeah, now that you see that, that problem, can you solve it? What's it take to solve that problem? And by the way, there are some problems you can't solve. <laughs> or the time is not right to solve them. We don't have what we need to solve them yet. But it's very exciting when you see something and say, you know, if these came together, we could do something. I'm thinking of a fellow named Paul Brainerd. Paul Brainerd was working in a typesetting company in Chicago, and they're setting type. You know, typesetting meaning they pick up pieces of type and they put it down and they assemble the words and then they put it on a plate which then is printed. He saw the Macintosh. He saw WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get fonts. He saw the laser printer which could print those fonts. It wasn't just 
hard set font. It was actually variable. You could do serifs. You could do all kinds of things. He said, you know, if we could take that Macintosh and we could take the laser printer and we had the right software, you know what we could do? We could create desktop publishing. We could do on a desktop what we do with these giant ATEX machines. A couple things went on here, right? The first was he was in the business. He knew the problem he was trying to, he knew the problem, the typesetting problem. Then the magic happened. He observed the new computer. He observed the printer. He didn't know much about software, but he said, if I could, we could do that. Lastly, the fourth piece came to play. Steve Jobs was having a hard time selling the Macintosh because he couldn't prove why it was better than a PC, the personal computer by IBM at that time. And along comes Paul Brainerd with a whole new application that could only be done on a Macintosh with a laser printer. Desktop publishing. And most of Macintosh's early success came from that solution. And so we had the manufacturer who needed a solution to sell its hardware. We had the software, and the rest is history. The company was later acquired by Adobe. So that's an example. There are many, many of those. So, so at Stanford, there were these two guys in this trailer. And they thought the web was interesting, but they needed a guide for it. So they observed that they really needed a way to find information. So they said, we could just do a directory. Why don't we just pick the best websites we can find and put a little guide together? And they went on to do that. And lo and behold, it was Jerry Yang, Dave Philo, and Yahoo. Then what happened, of course, was that they kept growing and growing and growing. And their concept was editors. Editors were people who would pick the best sports sites, the best business sites, and that would be their guide. They were getting inundated with requests to be included in their guide. Then I run into these two guys, Sergey Brennan and Larry Page, building across the street. And they said, you know, Yahoo's got it wrong. They created a market, but we think it creates an opportunity for another market. You can't keep up with editors to how fast the web is expanding. We need an automated guide. We've got a tool that does link analysis and link ranking, and we could use that. Now, we're going to, instead of editors, we're going to let the site that's most frequently linked to to be at the top of our search list. So they said, Yahoo's approach was great. It created a market. But we see a new market that they created, which is the need for automated link ranking. So then we have Yahoo, uh, Google, I'm sorry. So you can see how this goes. But observation, opportunity, execution, luck, all those things. But that's kind of the flow of things that we see happening. If I can keep going, I'm working with, um, with um, um, Marsha Lim at Stanford. And she thinks the world needs a private Facebook. Her daughter's getting married. She wanted to have that discussion with her daughter. Next thing you know, she's getting, wedding, she's getting information about how to plan her wedding. She's not getting married. Her daughter's getting married. But, Yahoo, but, sorry, but, but Facebook thought that she was the one getting married. She said, I don't want to share that stuff with my, I want to have a private Facebook. So what she's been working on, I'm sorry, it was Monica Lamb. What Monica's been working on is how to do a private Facebook using Dropbox and things like that. Again, Facebook created the market. But then the, where do we go? We go to phase two of this. How do we create a private Facebook? There's one that I'm working on also, App Medicine. App Medicine, Application Medicine. The problem we've got now is shorter doctor visits. The problem we've got is um, low cost. They're trying to do patient intake forms, where the doctor can say, answer these questions, fill them up before you come into the hospital, before you come in to see me. We can have a more informed discussion. But then you get into a whole bunch of things like HIPAA compliance. That's whatever HIPAA stands for, but it's basically patient privacy. So these things are happening all around us. So what I wanted to do today was tell you about one that's very real time. The company's called SoundTalk, and I know that they handed out the case. It's a case some of my students wrote. And it's about hearing aids. Boring hearing aids. How many people here's grandparents have hearing aids? Uh, comfortably 70%. That's a good number. How many people think their parents should have hearing aids? <laughs> about 50%. OK, that's all good. OK, so that's our first test of uh, is there a market. I was working with Rodney Perkins. He's the ENT, ear, nose, and throat doc at Stanford Hospital. And he said, you know, I'm involved in a lot of hearing aids. They're $3,000. 
And I'm seeing a lot of young people, 30-year-olds, coming into the hospital now with hearing problems. We know why, don't we? Those things that when I walk down the street, I can hear what you're listening to because you get the volume cranked up on your earbuds. Well, that's starting to happen too. He says, gee, I wish I could do something about that. And I said, Rodney, could you do something for less than $300? Hearing age of 3,000. And we started brainstorming about that. And sure enough, we thought about could you use a Bluetooth headset and so on. So let's talk about that process. But this company is not successful. They're just going to market. I'll demonstrate what we have. But I want to kind of walk you through the steps of identifying that market opportunity and then the hurdles which we now face. Now that we have a product, we're ready to go to market. The hurdles that we now face are actually creating the market, making it real, OK? So let's see if we can make the magic of technology work for us. We go. OK. All right, there was that. And there's this. So here's Soundhawk. First observation, OK, that there were 600 million people in the world who have hearing problems. We see that growing to over 900 million in the next 10 years. So what this was going to show you was that by age group, starting around age 30, age group 30, on up to age group 80, that we have anywhere from 29 to 70% of the population having hearing problems. And that represents about 15% market penetration. We say, wow, that's a great market. That's a great thing. Maybe not. Maybe there's a reason it's only 15%. Has anybody talked to their grandparents? They hate them. They don't fit. The batteries don't work. They don't like them. They can't hear well. There's a lot of problems with the device. So at first blush, everybody gets excited about this low market penetration. Wow, what a great opportunity. But there's other things going on here. So mistake number one, which I remember we talked about, was we get really excited about this. But in fact, there's a reason for that. So SoundTalk has come up with a solution. Let's look at a video of the solution, if I can make it work. And then we'll talk about the product. This is all the good stuff. Then we're going to talk about the bad stuff, what it takes to really make this market happen. Thank you for Most your... Most of us don't think about our images very often. Maybe we should. There are marvelous designs, unique to each of us, and able to collect the invisible sound waves to give meaning to our world. But there's a lot of sound out there. <laughs> Sometimes we miss things. Introducing the Soundhawk Smart Listening System. We paired a small, elegant, wearable device with a simple and powerful mobile app. Simply touch your smartphone screen to instantly personalize Soundhawk to you and your environment. We developed three ways to help you hear, communicate, and connect. Processing enhances key sounds, elevating what you want to hear while reducing unwanted background noise. Incline's a good call. We had a great time there last summer, right? <laughs> Get closer to what you want to hear in even the noisiest places. Simply place the wireless mic near any sound source, and that sound will be delivered directly to your ear. Wineries, great dinner too, but I'm so glad. With Bluetooth, you can talk hands-free on your smartphone, access Siri or Google Map, and even listen to the TV. We're on a mission to transform the listening experience, simply and affordably, for anyone who wants a smarter way to listen which turns out to be a lot of us. OK, so pretty exciting, right? I mean, I'm very excited about it. I got the little unit right here. This is the case. You charge the case, has about eight hours worth of charge. And then inside is the units themselves who get their charge from the case. And so of course, you just would put the earpiece in. I can hand you the wireless mic, particularly useful in a noisy restaurant. Yeah, I'll take that. 
Thank you. I'm so. not sure I want to hear from you. From <laughs> right. So I can be here, right? Okay, but pretty exciting, right? You think about that. DS, the DSE processing on the iPhone, when I bring up the app, that I place my finger on the screen and I go, this is clearer, this is clearer, this is clearer, this is clearer. I'm adjusting the coefficients for my hearing frequencies. So no more audiologists, all that stuff. Wow, this is even better. This is even better. It's got to work. Okay, let's see. So as I said, we launched it in July. Launched me, we did the press tour. It's going to market in about two weeks. So what, what am I worried about? I'm the voice of doom here, right? So let's see if this will work. The answer is yes, we have a slide. Okay. I'm just going to do it this way because I know it works. We had a lot of enabling ecosystem things happening here, right? First off, if you took a look at that case that we sent out, the FDA deregulated hearings. They really didn't do that. They created a new category called PSAP, Personal Sound Amplification Products. <coughs> there was politics involved here. They couldn't just deregulate hearing aids. They created a new category. And I'll talk about the politics in a minute. But the good news was, as long as we don't call it a hearing aid, we can sell it. It's going to, the same thing's going to happen with these, these medical devices. You know, As long as you don't call it a medical device, you can sell it. We got Bluetooth headsets. They cost us less than $50 to make one of these. The whole unit that, we, that I held up with the mic and is less than $100 to make. We've got smartphones now. We've got a computer we can use. We've got the app that I told you about to put in my coefficients. The app also stores your location. So if you're in a noisy restaurant, is the pretzel bell still here? Village bell? One of those old restaurants you could, and guess what? When you go back in, it's going to know where you are. It's going to bring back up those coefficients. We also have scenes, driving a car, listening to music, listening to TV. Wow, the amazing things with these apps. And of course, our engineers want to put another function in, replay the last 15 minutes of this conversation. You could do that now, right? Because you've got, you've got a smartphone. They also want it to be a walkie-talkie. So if we're riding bikes, I've got one, you've got one, we can hear each other on the bike. All possible. But we aren't there yet. We've got great ideas. We've got a product. What's the deal? Well, we've got some more good things happening. Wearable tech is cool. A friend of mine's wife said to me, she said, you know, I said, wouldn't you, wouldn't you, would you really want to wear this in public? And she said, sure I would. It's the coolest, latest wearable tech. I feel cool wearing it. Well, that's a big breakthrough from those of you who have people who've worn hearing aids, because hearing aids typically meant you're an old person. Right? Now, David and I talked about this. There's a 10x price difference. Good quality hearing aids cost $3,000. This is going to be retailing for $300. Personal rule. Whenever you have a 10x difference in price, you're disruptive. If it really is as good, so we took and did tests of the $3,000 hearing aids versus our unit. For up to 25 decibels, 25 dB of hearing loss, this is as good as a $3,000 hearing aid. That's a big deal. So hey, Fred, can I ask a quick question? Um, so on the FDA, which is the Federal uh, or the Drug, Drug Administration. Administration, which monitors a lot of the medical devices like hearing aids, um, we have this breakthrough in that they've changed the policy nomenclature yes. so you can have a hearing device which you can buy off the shelf. Right. But it's more than that, because with the hearing aid, you had to have other sort of hoops to jump through, right? The reason they created this new category was they felt hearing aids were overpriced. There was no, there was no competition in the market. The infrastructure, the audiologists, the ENT docs liked it the way it was. They lobbied the FDA to keep it the way it was. But the FDA said, we need to do something, so they created this new category called PSAP, Personal Sound Amplification Products. Okay, so you have audiologists. You have uh, different uh, vendors throughout this chain on the hearing aid right. uh, sort of market. And then you have this 10x price difference, and you talked about the word disruption. Can you talk to us in real terms what disruption could look like a little bit here? So what, what's, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? So you understand how there's a group of people who did not want this to be successful, OK? That's a big deal. It's like the newspaper industry didn't want the classified ad business to be successful either. What's going to happen is we're going to sell this for 300. People start using it. Next thing you know, people are going to say, 
you know, I'd rather use that than my hearing aid. It's better. It's not quite as good, but it's sort of good enough. It's sort of better. And we're going to make this better and better and better. And the next thing you know, it's going to be disruptive. It's going to eat into the business of the $3,000 guys. And that's how it's going to be disruptive. Maybe an audiologist, I mean, put it in real terms. Um, say I'm an audiologist and I have a family and I have my car payment, my house payment, and all that. And so they are going to face pressure in their industry if this takes off, right? I mean, that's They are going to do that. And we're going to talk about what they're doing in a minute. They see that coming. They see that disruption in their lifestyles coming. Okay. So again, everything seems really good. But here's the reality that I'm seeing. How do you create a market? That was one of the questions we had. So we identified it. We built a product. We can build it. OK, so what are my issues? What do I think the real issues are? Does it really work? You know, does it really work? Are there too many cracks and popples, pops in the background? Who does it really help? Now, it turns out that as I've tested this, it's scary. It's very scary. If you know anybody who has hearing loss, it is hugely debilitating. It's really debilitating. So what I'm finding is we're going to attract a lot of people who are desperate. They're looking for any solution that'll work. You know what's going to happen? This is not going to be good enough. Then you know what's going to happen on Yelp? People are going to say, I bought that piece of junk. My grandfather was really needed it. It didn't work. Oh, boy. Who does it really help? Can we, can we, can we segment the market to people with 25 dB and less hearing loss? You know what? The FDA won't let us use the term 25 dB or less, because suddenly we're prescribing. I have a lot of faith in the free market system. If this thing works, people will use it. And I mean, it, it will get there. But I'm really worried that we'll disappoint a lot of people. So who does it really help? And can we speak to them and try to stay out of the negative box of it didn't work for my grandfather? OK. Can the wearer make it work? There's buttons on this thing. There's a button on the top that turns it on. There's a button on the side that mutes it. When I give it to people, they put it in. Next thing you know, they turn it off. Well, we saw that happening. And now you get a message. When I turn it on, it says, power, I hear, power it up. When I push the button, mute button, it goes mute. So I'm getting some audio cues on those buttons. That's how we solve that problem. But there's still buttons on this thing. Will they wear it? So it's been my observation that men hate it. Men hate it. They don't want to admit the problem. They don't like the device. On and on it goes. And as I said, I've had great success with women. Turns out women are better listeners. Surprise. And in order to be a good listener, you have to listen. That means you want to hear. So it's been amazing. It's been amazing that, that uh, I've had great success with the women I've tried it with. Um, funny use cases popped up. A friend of mine, he wears it in his office. and. His wife wears the microphone, which I had here somewhere. Right here. Oh, you got I'm it. I'm wearing it. You've got it. And he goes, in the, he goes into his office, and she can, she can talk to him from the next room. Funny use cases start popping up, OK? What channel is required to sell it? Fine. There's a lot of people I know, older than 50, older than 60, who hate these things. And they let their grandchildren or children set it up, right? So doing this app and doing this programming might not work. We're selling it over the internet. We have people on the phone explaining to you how to use it. But maybe what we really need is a company like Lens Crafters. Lens Crafters is a place you go to get a quick prescription. It's a quick kind of eyeglass place. But they have trained people to fit you with the reading glasses or fit you with eyeglasses and on and on it goes. Well, maybe they could fit you to this. So maybe, we, maybe selling direct over the internet is not going to work. Maybe we have to go through somebody who actually has real people who can really help you program it and save it as a favorite. We don't know yet. We've talked about the FDA and audiologists. So what the audiologists are starting to do, and they're watching Soundhawk like a hawk, they want to make sure we claim it's not a medical device. Because if we walk across that line, as thin as it is, as, as flimsy as it is, they're going to go right into the FDA and say, shut, shut those guys down. They're selling a medical device. So what our strategy for that is, we're letting the press call it a medical device. We're letting the press call it a hearing aid. Let somebody else call it that. You'll never see anything in our literature that says 
that we're a medical device or a hearing aid. You know, why does this matter? Who cares? Because, as you pointed out, David, there are people whose lives and careers are embedded around the old $3,000 hearing aid, and we show up, and they're going to resist it. So, these are very real issues. Sometimes you see these in a different way. Sometimes you see these, you're too early for the market. You know, that you've got a solution, but because of some of these issues are so high. What if wearable tech wasn't cool right now? Suppose it wasn't time for that. Would this be successful? Maybe not. What if it was bigger? What if the DSP chips weren't as good? So sometimes if you're too early, you know the solution, but it's too early. It's always a judgment. It's always a risk. By the way, Steve Jobs was particularly brilliant on market timing. He didn't invent the MP3 player. You know what he did? He said, you know, Fred, he said, I, I was there, he said, you know, the MP3 player is there. I think I can get the record companies to let me list their content. I think I can make a cool device. I think the user interface could be really great. And if we put a hard drive in there, Steve said, I'm not going to introduce a product unless we can put a thousand songs on there. He felt once you get to a thousand songs, you're disruptive. So, but the pieces came together. His timing was superb. He knew when that would happen. When he came out with the iPhone, I said, Steve, that's the dumbest thing you've ever done. I said, what do you mean it's the dumbest thing? He used other words than that, but I said, Steve, it's the dumbest thing you've ever done. He said, why? I said, Steve, you never come to a market late. You're late to the phone market. You're not going to win. He says, I'm not late to the smartphone market. I'm going to create a new market. You know, because of his track record, he had to sit back and go, yeah, I guess so. When he said, I'm going to do a retail store, I said, Steve, that's the dumbest thing you've ever done. What do you know about retail? So the point being that some people can see those things. They can see the parts and pieces coming together in a way that some of us can't. But it's not genius alone. I know many people who are just brilliant. They can just sort of synthesize. They can just sort of observe, say, if you see that. But usually there's a lot of parts and pieces. My friend Paul Brainerd, page maker, Macintosh. Visible variable fonts on the screen, laser printer, software. It's those pieces that come together. So it won't surprise me that many of you have ideas. May, some of them will be way too early. Some of them might be too late. But this is kind of the genesis. So how do you do how do you how do you get over these barriers? How how are we at Soundhawk going to actually create the market? So what I'm an advocate of, and it was Clayton Christensen who wrote the innovator's dilemma and disruptive innovation, who first said it, discovery-based playing, this is the only thing you can do. You're never going to get it right at T0. It's just not going to happen. The world's going to change. By the time you get there, the world's moved over here. So obviously, you have to accept that you're not going to be right. You have to be nimble. It's all you can do. The market will give you answers. They'll tell us, hey, you know, this has too many crackles and pops in it. But what you need is the walkie-talkie feature. What you need is a, a mic that's better at a big, di noisy dining room table. You've got all these wine glasses and stuff. Make it stand up tall on the table. Who knows what they're going to say to us? They're going to give us answers about what we have, but not what they need. You have to be very careful when you listen to that feedback, because you know what the engineers are, that we have are going to do? They're going to want to do a 24-hour turnaround to fix that antenna problem. It may not be the right problem to work on. So one more time, it's knowing the right problem to solve, not finding the answers that's the challenge. So I don't know where this is all going. Truly, it's in the next 18 weeks that we're going to find out an awful lot. And the place I can't wait to sit is up in Bend, Oregon. I'm going to sit on the support lines and listen to the calls that come in and listen to the people. Here's a, so I'm talking to the head of support. And she's talking about how she's going to educate all these people, people like yourselves, to answer the questions. I said, you know what? We might need old people on the phone. Because maybe they understand the problem better. Maybe they can relate better to the users calling in. I don't know. But let's listen. Let's listen for the average age of the people calling in. Let's listen for the questions. So you can see what an iterative process this is. So I love the imagination of identifying the market, even building the product. I love it. But this is the piece. This is the piece, specifically this piece, the creation questions that are where companies fail. They can fail because they're too early. They could fail because they don't see them, or they could fail because they don't do discovery-based planning. Venture capitalists 
hate discovery-based planning. They want a business plan. They want to hold you accountable to execute against the business plan. These milestones, these revenues by these dates, doesn't work that way. So as always, I like to set people's expectations. I say, hey, if you're going to invest in this company, it's not all going to work the way we planned. Yeah, we know that. We know. No, I really want you to understand this. It's not going to go the way we planned. So setting those expectations is an important point. All righty, the last point. Every new market spans a new market opportunity. We were at breakfast this morning, and we were talking about this. And I said, you know what's going to happen? I'm afraid I'm going to leave this in the restaurant this morning. Guess what new market this creates? Find my sound talk. Right? Find my earpiece. Find my keys. Well, there's some experiments going on in that space right now, but every new market spawns another new market. There's another new set of problems that come with this. Battery life, obviously, is one that we, we've, we need to know about. So when you see something like this, ask yourself, what other problems is this going to spawn? And I'm always humbled by how easy it is to find those. You know why? You put this on, and you're going to know in a few minutes what the, the flaws are. You're going to see new opportunities. When we talked about the, that was called um, SUP, S-U-P, already you've identified things that it could do better or things that it should do or maybe even new opportunities. Changing the way social networks operate. Maybe there's some bigger idea there. Monica Lamb, this professor at Stanford, she wants to do a private Facebook. Maybe there's a private SUP. I don't know. But sometimes things that you think are really cool aren't the end of the game. The beginning of a new game, and you might be the one to see it. David? Thank you, Fred. Well, I just want to um, tie together a few things that Fred's saying to what we've um, said before, then open it up for questions, because it's a great opportunity to engage with these things. Remember last week when Bart Sup said, we had the conversation about, well, I presented to the VCs my company, and it was called Luxy, and it did this and this, and actually now we're Sup, and we're not even doing those things. We're doing something entirely different. And somebody asked, well, um, don't you think the VCs would be upset because you're now using your money towards a different end? This is, this is what Fred's talking about. In the discovery process, right, he discovered that there was other, other uses, and he discovered that the, through feedback that there was other needs, right? And so there is a pivoting uh, process that takes place in an iteration in this discovery-based thing that really connects this. So um, I'd like, I'd like um, to open up the floor. We have some mics, so it'd be helpful um, to the extent to which we can use the mics for the questions. Ask Fred anything. So Fred, obviously, um, knows a lot of people, has been a part of a lot of um, big conversations that you and I um, read about on a regular basis, um, and a lot of experience and perspective on creating new markets. And so I'd just like to um, give you an opportunity to kind of engage with him on some of those subjects. <coughs> So I have a two-part question. So raise your hand so I can see where you're coming from. Oh, you're right there. Yeah, and your name is? Uh, I'm Zach Whitford. I'm a freshman. Zach? Yes. Zach. Um, so I have a two-part question. My first part is, um, given that a majority of your users are what's called them elderly. It's called them elderly. Those, I'm okay with that. Uh, and they're not generally tech savvy. Yes. Aren't you worried that it will be very hard for them to calibrate the system Make sure all the different components are working at the same time if you really want your product. Uh, yeah, sync and Bluetooth. I'm very worried. I'm very worried, Zach. I'm very worried. And they're trying to skew, they're trying to use marketing words, marketing positioning to try to push it down to the 50s, to the 50s as a smarter way to listen as opposed to the old person who needs a hearing aid. But I'm not sure I like that because the issue you're talking about is dead on, dead real. And my second part is, um, Speaking as a college student who forgets to charge his phone a large amount of time, how your, your product relies on two different charge. I have to remember to charge the item and then charge my phone. Is there any backup system in case my phone dies? And also, you're using like a lot of very battery intensive things, location services, Bluetooth. Those are the two highest battery consumption methods. How does that affect the battery life of my phone? I have to go right back to you, Zach. What new market opportunity did that create? You identified a problem. You're exactly right. What new market did that identify? Lithium polymer batteries. Hey, I'm, ta I'm, I'm asking you. You've just said there's a new, new problem. The new, new problem is charging multiple devices. Wireless charging, inductive. It's got to happen, right? It ha it, we, this is a bad problem. You've identified a bad problem. It could inhibit this market from growing. Therefore, maybe there is an expanding need case for wireless charging. 
you win, you know, this, heaven forbid this be the tip of the iceberg, but you've done the classic thing. You've identified a new market. Not that we don't know about it, but maybe it's time is coming. You're brilliant. You didn't know that. <laughs> Got a question right here. Yeah, okay, looking for that hand so I can find the face. Let's yes. give a mic. Let's give a mic, though. And your name, please, is? So, oh, my name's Madeline. Um, so didn't, didn't hear it, didn't hear it. Madeline. Madeline, yes, Madeline. Yeah, so I guess in terms of uh, looking at the market from a late or early perspective, um, so talking about how our generation has, everyone pretty much has a smartphone now, are you taking that into consideration when you're creating and redefining and redesigning your product, but also looking at the fact that maybe by the time you are thinking of launching this for possibly our generation who as an older population once we get to that stage of needing hearing aids that we're going to have smartphones but maybe there's something else that's already going to be developed and how do you kind of um how do you kind of determine what your launch pad will be once you've figured out all those factors i guess with samantha or martha Madeline. Madeline. Yep. I'll get a, I'll get a two for two. Hey, if you're not... It's a hard name if, to remember. If you're, willing, if you're not willing to say the name, you've got to be willing to make a mistake. So Madeline. Okay, Madeline. So Madeline, two things. It's very important to take a point of view. Bang. Put a stake in the ground. Read... Um, I'm going to say read Harlem. Read Hastings. Netflix. Read Hastings. Put a stake in the ground said, the world's going to go to CDs. At that time, they were, they were video cassettes, right? He said, the world's going to CDs. Not many people have them, but that's the way the world's going. I'm going to bet my whole company on CDs. They're cheap. They're easy to put in the mail. The rest is history. But Steve Jobs put a stake in the ground saying, the world is going to go without a keyboard. You've got to take a position. You could be dead wrong, Madeline. You could be dead wrong. But the benefit of which is, you really know where you're going. So we've taken the viewpoint that smartphones will be ubiquitous. They're not now, but they will be. We just take that as a given. And so we will grow proportionate to the availability of these kind of devices, yes. It's the right bet. The question is, is it in the right time? And you give up too much. You can't do this on a dumb phone. So it's kind of self-fulfilling. But taking a point of view about the future is critical to you being a leader. You know, the, the, the cloud computing is a wonderful thing, but it's becoming easy to copy now. Amazon, Google, Facebook, Apple. Who has a point of view about where that's really going? Who's going to be the leader of that space, or is it just going to be a commodity? The guy who takes a position about where that's going and what platforms look like in the future, if they're right, they're going to be the leader. Got a question down here. We have a mic. Keep going, keep going. Hi, um, my name hey. is Yanko. Yanko, I got that right this time. Yanko, okay. Yeah. Um, so you've created the product and you've got the market. Um, it seems more like you're targeting it towards 30 year olds to like 50. Yep. Um, is there a way that you could possibly target it maybe towards younger generations where you could have it almost like a wireless headset and Bluetooth connector? I saw that you were doing more of that. Um, is there a way that you can focus it so that you've got a <laughs> consumer um, uh, uh, dependency upon your product and uh, relationship between you and as they progress through their age? We're all working the same problem, which is trying to find a way to get into a market segment that it works, right? Here's where marketing can make big mistakes. We can try to push it somewhere like to the younger crowd or to these 30 to 50 year olds and it keeps going up market on us and it's older people who keep wanting to use it. So we could do it it is a Bluetooth headset, but we don't want to market it as a Bluetooth headset because it's a very competitive space. But it's a great Bluetooth headset. So you can see where there's a lot of holes in everything I'm saying here. There's a lot of unknowns. I wish we could do that. I don't know if we have the right product for them. We can't say it's a hearing aid, so we've got some problems there. We've got this tough user interface. Maybe it's too geeky to use. You know, maybe the charging issue is a problem. You're making me nervous, team. You're making me nervous. But this is the reality. I, I'm, I'm, I know there's a solution here. I just don't know if this is it. Let's take one more question. Up in the corner. Hi, I'm Britton. 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 Um, why not make it a hearing aid? Okay. 
Excellent question, and a little bit more than I know, and I bet there's some people here who know more about it than I do. To make it a hearing aid, to make this a hearing aid, a very reasonable alternative requires FDA approval. FDA approval takes a long time, and I'm not, I'm not familiar with the, all the parts of trials and tests and so on and so forth, but as I recall, the team indicated it was three years. So that's, that's the, now maybe there's a fast track now with the FDA, I don't know, but I bet you what? I bet you the existing hearing aid industry would be in there saying don't fast track that. So there'd be people who'd quickly get wind that we were trying to fast track this for the approval process. So we're trying to get those critical dependencies off our, <coughs> off our path. Startups have to find where the ball is rolling down the hill. They, rolling up the hill is a really tough play, way to do it. FDA approval, FDA approval typically takes a lot of money, on and on it goes. So not a good answer. Maybe we didn't push it hard enough. Certainly something to think about. Maybe we should have tried. So we've, we've seen Yahoo, and you'll see the um, fate of Yahoo changing in the next uh, few weeks and months even as the Alibaba IPO for 20 billion plus impacts their bottom line. We've seen SUP, which is a company that literally just came out and we're doing customer feedback on it. And now in two weeks, Soundhawk, which is going to start being marketed out to a, a broader market, see if it's going to become a new market. It's pretty exciting stuff. Thank you, Fred, for being with us. You, Please join me in welcome. Thank you. And this is the one that I see most entrepreneurs get wrong. So I'm going to talk for like a little bit about this. And I, so I get, you know, people email me a lot about looking for investment opportunities and things like that. And the craziest thing is that a lot.